Hey, Mountain Springs, Daniel here. I hope you are doing so well. I'm so thankful for this opportunity every weekend where we can talk together and we can share life together around the Word of God. I wanted to begin this weekend with a personal update. So many of you have emailed me about my sabbatical. Uh, my sabbatical was scheduled to begin uh, Monday morning, Memorial Day. And I want to let you know that we have chosen, Laurie and I, uh, in collaboration with the elders, to postpone the sabbatical for one year. And so though I'll be having some time off this summer with vacation with my family, the elders and I and Laurie really felt like we needed to delay for a year. And frankly, we couldn't see ourselves being gone this summer as we consider how we can regather, reconvene and reopen this campus for ministry. So I wanna let you know of that as we begin. Are we disappointed? Yes, honestly, a little bit. It's 21 years now of serving at Mountain Springs and we were kind of excited about it, but nonetheless, that being said, we are excited about what God is doing here and we are glad to continue to lean in for another year. If you have your Bibles with you this weekend, we're gonna look at a few different biblical texts. I'm gonna encourage you first to turn to Jeremiah 29, also Ezra chapter one. And for those of you that are wanna be overachievers, go ahead and turn to Psalm 137. You're joining us on a weekend where we are now about five months into this Old Testament journey through the grand narrative of God's Word, where we're looking at the redemption story. We're looking at the heart of God for His people. And here we are now, just two or three weeks away from getting into the New Testament, the life of Jesus, the Gospels, and then the launch of the early church in the book of Acts. But here's where we're at this weekend. This weekend, we are looking at arguably one of the most significant, symbolic, and significant as it relates to important in the life of the Jewish people events in all of the Old Testament, and that is the exile. The exile. The Babylonian exile to where God's people were taken in 587 BC was a watershed moment for the Jewish people. It was a watershed moment and it stands in history. And to this day, there are those that are still looking back to the exile as this pertinent turning point in the history of their nation. But in so many ways as well, the exile and the subsequent restoration are also deeply personal for us. And so today in this message, I've entitled it Exile and Restoration. Exile and Restoration, how we ourselves can be exiled, but be restored by Jesus Christ. But let's pray and then we'll dig into the Word this weekend. Lord, we honour You and we bless You. And I pray Your Kingdom would come now as we listen and engage with Your Word no matter whether we are in a watch party where we've got families over right now and we're watching this together, we're on our own, we're on a hike, no matter where we are, Lord, come. Holy Spirit, would You come now and fill our hearts with faith to believe that our broken and our exiled heart can be restored in Jesus. In Your name we pray, amen, amen. The last time uh, that I spoke in the series, the sun was setting over the nation of Judah, the city of Jerusalem. The Babylonian army had come. They had come and over one year, they had entirely pillaged Jerusalem. They had plundered the city and they had burned the temple. It was a dark day. And it was such a dark day because this entire national image that was established by God, the temple had been torn down and the city lay in ruins. Well, as much as the city was destroyed, the people of God were displaced. And the days and the months and the years that followed, thousands of God's people were taken and relocated throughout all of ancient Babylonia. And really, as you look back to the Genesis account of creation, much like Adam and Eve, when they fell through sin, were escorted from the Garden of Eden in the same way God's people now of Judah in the promised land were escorted out of the land of promise into a land that would be foreign and unknown to them. They were escorted into a barren land. So much so, really overnight, God's people became a minority. They were surrounded by unfamiliar people. They were called to worship an unknown God. And ultimately, they were immersed in a culture that was so counter their culture, they were trying to fathom and understand. Well, as you would imagine, 
Anytime we lose something that matters deeply to us, we are left wondering and asking questions of identity and purpose. And so much so as you would expect, as they go and lose everything, waves of despair rolled in. Psalm 137 reveals their pain. It says in verse one, by the waters of Babylon, by the waters of Babylon, it says, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. Zion is the promised land. What they're saying is we were looking back and we realised what we lost. Verse two, on the willows there, we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required us to sing songs and our tormentors mirth. One translation of that word mirth can mean they were making light of. And so by making light of what they had lost, they said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. It's in the poetry of these Psalms. It's in the poetry of these Psalms that we gain this behind the scenes glimpse of what God was doing in and through their lives and yet also present in their hearts. The confusion, the disappointment, the regret and the pain. And it was deep. It was real. They had lost something that they had loved and through sin they were escorted out and now they're longing for that to return. So much so, they were so turned around because of this pain. Many of the people fell into one of two camps. The first camp you could describe as the camp that would be maybe the resistors. The resistors. There were those that were so repulsed by the oppression of Babylon that at every step and at every turn of ancient Babylonia, They were repulsed by it. They revolted against it and they were known as the resistors. You also had a second camp. They were known as maybe the compromisers and where the earlier group resisted everything and sought to push back with aggression, the second group caved in with apathy. They squandered their culture. They bought into the way of Babylonia. They adopted their practices and they worshipped their gods. Thousands during the time in Babylonia fell into one of those two camps, but there was a third camp. And the third camp of people didn't take their marching orders through anger or apathy, but rather through listening to the words of God through the mouth of the prophet Jeremiah. And he told them to do something seemingly counterintuitive. We pick it up in Jeremiah 29, this famous, iconic text of Jeremiah. Verse four, to all of the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Jeremiah's charge was not one of revolt. Jeremiah's charge was not one of compromise, but instead he says, settle down, make a life, make a living, grow there, build a house, have a family, plant a garden. And it speaks about this degree of permanence where we have the compromises and you have the resistors, you might say that this third group would be called the investors. The investors, they were called to invest in Babylon. So much so, verse seven, he says, seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray, pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, that's Babylon, you will find your welfare. Invest where you are. We're called to invest where we are. Why? Because God works through our faithfulness. One of the most well-known of all of those living in exile that invested their life and lived with an investment strategy was Daniel. He put his the words of Jeremiah into action where he neither revolted, he certainly did not compromise as we saw last weekend in the message. He stepped up, he stood for God and he made a difference. And because of that, God preserved him and God promoted him. And yet with all of this story of Daniel and the redemptive bright spot of the life of Daniel, so much so this entire time was one of great desperation and of great darkness. So mercifully in the middle of their pain, 
And in the middle of their uncertainty, Jeremiah goes on to say in verse 10, for thus says the Lord God, when 70 years are completed, I'm gonna visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to the place where you came. For I know, verse 11, this is the verse that we love, but this is the context of this verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Can you imagine hearing that? huddled together in the synagogue. It's good news, right? It's really good news that we're gonna get out of here. But yeah, although it's good news, it's 70 years. It's a long while. Seeming to imply there would be some there gathered in the synagogue with their family and their friends and their loved ones. They would hear this taste of freedom. They would hear this call and this promise of God, yet they would realise, I might not live to see that day. I might die here in darkness and I might not see that bright new promise of breakthrough. Men and women, this is a dark place where sometimes we find ourselves where we begin to question and doubt whether we will actually live long enough to taste freedom, to experience breakthrough and to realise deeply that God's promises for us are yes and amen. And I wanna say to those of us right now that feel as if we're in the synagogue gathered hearing a message of hope that would never apply to us. And I wanna say this, remind God of the promise in your life. Pray, believe, lean into it. Jeremiah took this opportunity to remind them saying, your God has moved mountains before and your God will do it again. Your God has delivered the people, the exodus, the exile, the coming out of. He shall do it again. He has done it before. Our God is a miracle working, promise keeping, saving, grace filled God. Lean into those promises. Lean into that place because no matter our depth of betrayal, God's depth of grace and goodness surpasses that which we are capable of. Of doing. I love what the old poem says that God is the great hound of heaven. He's chasing and racing through heaven to reach and to save those that are lost. Our God loves to reach and find lost things. Well, finally, after seven decades of darkness, just as the prophets had foretold, there would be a day where a king, a Persian king, would puncture their darkness with this ray of hope and this ray of light. The book of Ezra, chapter one, verse one. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord might be fulfilled through the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. Verse two, thus say, Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Verse three, whoever is among you, of all his people, pay attention to the wording here, may his God be with him, let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. It was a remarkable turn of events. This hand of God was moving. And what's remarkable is this, that God moved such to work through a Persian king to where the Persian king wouldn't just permit their return, he would also fund their repatriation and fund their restoration of worship. Verse four, he says, "'Let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns, journeys, walks, be assisted by the men of this place with silver and gold. What would happen in the days and the months that would follow would be both dramatic, but also prophetic. The people would begin to go back to their home. Ezra chapter two, verse one. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. Sometime after returning, about a year or so, they begin to get to work with their 
project. They rolled up their collective sleeves and they got together as community and they began to rebuild the temple, not to its former glory, so much so that some that were older saw the foundation forming and they wept, whereas others were filled with joy. Why? The ones with joy had never seen this. The ones that wept had seen once what was lost. So much so, verse 11, the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. They were so happy and they started so strong doing God's work. Well, how many of you right now would say you realise this to be true in your life that the last time you did something great for God, in no time at all, it seemed as if there were those standing in opposition to you. Well, true in our lives, true in their lives, so much so the neighbouring nations heard of what was going on in Judah. They heard of what was happening in Jerusalem with the rebuilding of the temple and they came and they came with their voices, their dissenting voices and the volume began to increase. But in an isolated moment, a really great moment, a high point for the people of Judah, they actually held the line. They pushed back on the descending voices. They reduced the volume. They didn't listen to it. And they said, nothing will stop us doing the work of God. Nothing shall stop us. We're gonna lean into God's work. We're gonna do what is required. We love God. We honour God. We're gonna do all that it takes to build the temple until they didn't. And they were stopped. So much so though, they weren't stopped because of external dissension. They were stopped and apprehended in the work because of their own internal distractions. More often than not, we are not prevented to do the work of God because of an external dissension, but because of an internal distraction that we permit. And they began to turn their attention from God's house to their houses essentially from the yard that was the temple bounds, the footprint of the temple to their own backyard. And we can only guess and to surmise as why. We don't know why. It's not really in the text. Maybe it was the dissension was getting too much. Maybe the long hours were getting too long and maybe there was something. And yet all that we know is that one by one, family by family, they began to walk away from building the house of God. But I've got a hunch about something. And though I can't prove it in the text, I don't believe they intended to entirely abandon the work. Meaning, if you read into the text there, it's almost as if they said, we'll come back next week. Maybe we'll come back next month. We've just got to get the harvest done first. We'll come back, God, to building your house. But, but right now, we've just got a lot going on. And I don't believe it was that they ever said we're entirely done, but yet before they knew it, one week passed, one month passed, two years, four years, five years, seven years, 10 years, 12, 15, 16 years passed by. 16 long years. And then all of a sudden they realized that the temple project that was a foundation had been overgrown. And that which was a work of God now looked more like a disbanded, abandoned cinema sites on the north end of our town where people drove past going, I wonder what will ever happen to that. And people ask the question, is that how serious they take their God? Now, men and women, there is such a personal application point here and that is this. There are people watching our lives as we work for God. And I don't believe we ever intentionally say, I'm going to abandon the work of God, but yet sometimes life just happens. And before we know it, our newborn is nine. Our nine-year-old is now married. And we look back upon our lives and say, wow, we started so strong, but we're not doing so well now. Well, like we've seen before, God apprehended their apathy through raising up a voice of prophecy. And God raised up a prophetic voice and his name was Haggai. Haggai chapter one, verse four. He says this, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? Essentially saying, you've done such a great job of doing all of the home projects. He says, but the house of God lies in ruins. He says, verse five, now therefore, this is what God is saying. Consider your ways. Why? Here's why. Because although you have sown much, you have harvested little. 
You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes in it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. Twice now God has said, consider your ways. Why? That you may take pleasure in building a house to where I may be glorified, says the Lord. Do you see what he's saying? The prophet Haggai is saying, you ever go through life where it feels as if you longed for that one thing? That one thing, if you got that one thing, that one thing would bring the joy into your life and you finally got it? And it didn't. And Haggai says in the same way, you effort, you try so hard, you go to great lengths to do all of this and yet you're efforting and yet it's not bringing the return that you expect. Why? Because you have lost your focus on God. He says, consider your ways. He says this to a people that have come back to the land of promise. And he says, consider your ways. And in verse nine, he goes on to say something that in, in, in many ways requires great explanation. So I'll say so in just a moment. Verse nine, he says, you looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, now pay attention to this because it might challenge some of our theology, theological frames. When you brought it home, I, God, blew it away. Why? Declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. So effectively, there is a consequence, Haggai is saying, there is a consequence to our loss of focus when we live with wrong priorities. He says, God says, I blow away your best attempts. Now, I want to walk this theological line carefully because ultimately I believe that God is kind. God is loving. God is long-suffering. His mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Great is the faithfulness of God. And as we walk this theological line, I don't mean to infer in any way that a minor mishap of our lives results in the anger of God because in the place of grace, God forgives and God overlooks and God invites us home. However, now really lean in and track with me during this segment of the message. I believe that there are times in our lives where it's as if God ordains life to feel harder than it needs to feel. Where it's almost as if God ordains it to be to where we're exhausted, where there's an emptiness, where there's a struggle and where it feels as if every time we seek to do something, it's as if we're on a bike ride without electric assist going uphill. And we have the struggle and we long for the downhill. We're even happy with the plateau, but life feels like an uphill. Why? Now hear me. I believe it's the loving heart of God to say, I don't want to leave you to your own devices. I don't want to leave you to your own distractions. I want to call you to my call and commission to be a restored people. And so God says, all of this, He permits and ordains distractions and hardship and struggles and seasons of grappling with life. Why? To say this, consider your ways. I think for all of us this weekend, for all of us listening on this podcast right now, we need to consider our ways. Because though we never necessarily entirely intend to walk away One year happens, three years happen, five years happen, and before we know, we no longer know the heart of God. And the heart of God is such as the great hound of heaven to come and to pursue us. I said at the top of our message how exile is one of incredibly rich symbolism and kingdom imagery. And here's why, and here's why. In so many ways, Israel's experiences through the Babylonian era, in many ways, are an image of something much more universal. 
much more universal because exile is one of the central underpinning and yet often overlooked themes central in the gospel message. When I say the word exile, many of us in our common currency of words think of exile as an issue of a, maybe a geopolitical deportation or some sort of expatriation. You're being told to leave, therefore you're in exile. But exile is much more than that. Exile is actually this deep longing in our lives for life to be different than it actually is. Exile is this longing and believing that there is more to life regardless of where we live. It's where we find ourselves today. We might say, man, I've got a great home. I've got a great family. I've got a graduate. I've got a business that's thriving. I've got all of these things. And yet at the same time, we're all too acutely aware that we ultimately live in a world stained and scarred and pained by the depravity of humanity. We see crimes and wrongdoing and hardship permitted by those around us. Yet we look inside of our own hearts and we see it perpetuated too by us. We judge what we see, but then we enter into that fallenness and we perpetuate it ourselves. Don't miss this. The Bible tells us that exile is the condition of the human heart. Exile is the condition and the effect of our choices, but also both the location and the condition of our hearts. We're all guilty of repeating what we see in Judah. We're all guilty of what we see repeated throughout the line and the lineage of the people of Israel, that we're guilty of corruption. And in so many ways, our corruption and our sin leads us to a Babylon that we can neither overthrow nor redeem ourselves from. And we live in that place, longing to be restored longing to be restored. It's in our exile that we want restoration. Over the last five months, we have gone on this remarkable journey all the way from creation and the Garden of Eden to the fall of Genesis 3. Now all the way through the final part of the book of Malachi, what we see is there was no king strong enough There was no wealth to where we could be rich enough. There was no opportunity or idol or pursuit to where we could be free enough. And throughout all of this journey, the people of Israel are on this desperate pursuit, this journey to recover that which was lost in Eden. And in the same way that Adam and Eve were escorted into a barren land, in the same way Judah, because of their sin, were escorted into a barren land in the same way we are longing in our barren land to be welcomed back into Eden. And so much so, Israel's future and our future too all hang in the balance as we near the final pages of the Old Covenant. And it's this longing that we're left with in the Old Testament. It's this longing for Eden to return. But thank God. Now, come on now. Thank God that on every page throughout Scripture, on every page from Genesis chapter 1 through the finale of the story of new creation in the Revelation, we see glimpses of one that shall come one that is worthy, one that is worthy to unroll the scroll, to declare the exiles to be restored, for those far from God to be brought home. Because only one is worthy. No king lifted up by man, no event, no idol, no pursuit, no wealth, no land. We long for a Saviour. 
And we can meet the one that comes. We can meet the one that everyone speaks of. For unto us a child shall be born, Isaiah tells us. For unto us one shall come to go into exile with us. Jesus began His ministry by going into exile. It says He left in the fullness, He came back in the power. Why? Because He went into the dark, barren lands and He brought back those in exile. And He holds the keys of the kingdom. He looses the captives. He sets the captives free. Why? Because He walked the road of exile, was victorious, in the land and the heartland of the enemy, took the keys of the kingdom and brings the booty, brings the lost home, brings the people, brings the spoils, brings the prize. We are the prize. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our exile has been ended through the love of Jesus Christ. There is now no one too far, no one beyond the arm and the reach of God. Right now, no sin, no struggle, no cycle, no season, no situation or circumstance limits the love of God towards you. He goes to exile. He goes to the barren places to bring us home. In these next few weekends, we're gonna look at a queen we're gonna look at Esther. We're then gonna wrap up the old covenant. And then we're gonna allow this quiet as all creation leans in going, there's one coming, there's one coming. And His name is Jesus Christ. And through Jesus, the only one worthy, the only one able, the one more than able, we can have freedom. Our sin has been overcome. Our exile has been broken. Trust Jesus with your life. Let's pray. Father, we honour You and we bless You today and we thank You that You come and You rescue our exiled hearts. You come and You reach us in far off lands and far off places and broken situations and You bring us into a land of restoration so that worship will be restored through our lives. We honour You and we thank You that exile is defeated, restoration is offered and the mission is completed through the person of Jesus Christ. We trust You with our lives. In Your Name we pray, Amen.